Well, as they're all getting situated, I want you to open your Bibles to Acts in chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. And uh, if you want to follow along on the YouVersion Bible app, you can open that up and find my study notes there on the YouVersion Bible app. And uh, we'll be able to have some time together. That was so fun. Man, I love it. Twelve families. That was incredible. That was insane. Thanks for being a part of that. Well, the title of today's message is, When the Going Gets Tough, what's the rest of that phrase? The tough get going. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. But today we're going to learn, when the going gets tough, what we should do, what you and I should do as followers of Jesus, is we need to pursue community and pray continually. Pursue community and pray continually. Act chapter 4, verse 23, let's check it out as we read it together. Verse, four, uh, verse 23, Acts chapter 4. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priest and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them? Who through the mouth of your father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers Rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. Verse 27. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. In verse 29. And now, Lord, look upon the threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. While you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, check this out, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. Kind of like our chosen Sunday, if you were here, that was a crazy Sunday. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with what? With all boldness, with all boldness. Oh, Father, today, this evening, this afternoon, this gathering, this Sunday, we pray in all boldness that you would come and fill this place with your Holy Spirit. Lord, not my word spoken here, but your word spoken, that it would do what it is intended to do, to correct, to encourage, to direct, to lead, to convict. Would you have your way here this morning? Thank you for this word. Thank you for these families. Lord, we are expectant this Sunday evening. You're going to move. You have a word for us today. And I believe without a shadow of a doubt that you have drawn men and women here tonight for a reason. Not a happenstance, but a divine appointment tonight. That you would speak directly to their hearts today. Because when the going gets tough, what are we to do? Oh, Lord, I believe your word is going to speak to us this evening. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We believe God's given us a vision, amen, to proclaim the name of Jesus, that all would look to him and be saved. Our desire is to be a church family, a faith family, learning how to love and live just like Jesus. So for these next few moments and minutes, we're going to spend some time in God's word, learning from it today. And we're going to learn a few things. First, we're going to learn that we all have dark days in our life. Can you remember the hardest season of your life? Maybe the worst day that you've ever had. And maybe you're saying, well, that was act this season was actually right now. This is probably the worst season of life I've ever had. Or maybe you hear this evening and you say, well, I'm just coming out of the worst season. Or I feel like I'm heading into the worst season. Or I remember a few years ago, that was the worst season. Well, what are we to do when we encounter hard times? And more importantly, the question we need to ask is, how do we view the sovereignty of God, the power of God, the control of God, his rule and reign in our life? How do we view his sovereignty in light of hard times? What do we do when the, tough, when the going gets tough? I believe in our passage for us this evening, we're going to learn just what to do. Look at verse 23. You'll see something there right off the bat. When they were released. Look at that word, released. When they were released. We've been spending the, fat, the past few weeks thinking about what has occurred earlier in Acts chapter 3. We spent a few moments thinking about the miracle, the miracle of a lame man who was over 40 years old, who had never walked a day in his life. In a miraculous moment, Jesus heals him and begins to walk and leap and praise the Lord. That miracle led to a message preached by Peter. 
a message that was filled with, with power and the Holy Spirit. It was a, it was a, uh, a message that uh, was accusatory, right? They, it kind of arose guilt in their life, but it pointed them to Jesus. And through this miracle, through this message, there was a movement. The church went viral. And all of a sudden, we read a few weeks back, maybe last week, that after this message from Peter, after this miracle, 5,000 people received Jesus as their Lord and Savior. It was a movement. The church went viral. But after the miracle and after the message and into the movement, we see now the mess, (laughs) the mess. We read last week that Peter and John, who were doing something stupendous, healing someone, no co-pay or nothing, just a free healing, you think everybody would like that, but no, people did not like it. And the Sadducees came, remember last week, and they arrested Peter and John for no reason and threw them in prison overnight. And so we're reading in verse 23 that they are now released. It's the next day. They've been released from prison. And what I want you to understand is that from this moment on, there's a shift in the church, the early church. From this moment on, things have changed From this moment on, we're going to see not just a movement that is great and glorious. There's going to be some persecution. It's going to get harder and harder and harder. And Peter and John will be thrown in prison again. And they're going to be threatened again. And the church is going to, it's going to explode. It's still going to be viral, but it's going to be tough. There's going to be trials and tribulation, and there's going to be struggle. We're going to learn next week about Ananias and Sapphira. The church is being uh, attacked, and it's gnarly. There's a shift and so we need to learn, what, what do we do when there's a shift in our life? When something changes and something is hard, something is difficult. That's what we have before us. So first, when the going gets tough, we need to pursue community. Look at verse 23, pursue community. When they were released, they're released from prison, what do they do? Where do they go? They went to their friends. Watch the text, their friends. They went to their friends. Circle that word, highlight that word. I had never thought about that before. I read this chapter so many times, but for the first time I recognized The first thing they did was they went to their friend's house. Now, we don't know who their friends were. Was it maybe Lazarus and Mary and Martha's place? They went there a lot. Is that whose door they knocked on? We don't know, but they went to someone's friend's house. Can you you just picture that? I mean, can you picture this moment, waking up in jail, being released? Where are they going to go? Where's Peter and John going to go? They said, well, let's go to our buddy's house. And they, they walk over, they knock on the door, and they enter in, and maybe it was like a scene from Central Perk on Friends. Maybe you guys saw the, the reunion there. I'm not sure if you guys saw that. Friends had a reunion, but anyway. And they go, go in there, and, and they're sitting on the couch, and they're talking, they're having coffee. Like, what was that scene? What was happening? Well, we read in verse 23 that they reported what had happened. You see that there? They reported what had just occurred. No one knew what had happened. And so Peter and John are in their friend's house. They're saying, hey, listen, check it out. We were just going to the church to pray. And Peter sees this guy laying there, and, and John's like recall, recalling it, like, I don't know what Peter was doing and what he was thinking, but he reaches out, grabs the guy's hand, pulls him up. Jesus heals this man. We can't believe it. Peter begins to preach. People get saved, and then we get arrested. And he's recalling this account at their friend's house. I just wonder, where would you run to? Wh- whose door would you knock on? After a crisis, after a dark day, a hard season, what kind of community do you pursue? If you were to look at your phone and who's the, who's the top favorite list on your speed dial on your phone? Hopefully it's your, maybe your spouse is number one, a good friend, maybe your parents. When the, tough, when the going gets tough, we Christians, we need to pursue community, pursue friendship. Proverbs 27, verse 9, write this in the margin of your Bible, great verse. Ointment and perfume delight the heart, and the sweetness of a friend gives delight by hearty counsel. There's just a sweetness of having a friend. Sweetness of sitting over at a friend's house and just talking and just relating and just conversing. Pursue community. Now, I use the word pursue community on purpose. Pursue. Because it speaks of two different things. We need determination in friendship, determination in community. It takes energy to have friends. It takes effort to reach out. It takes determination to stay connected. It's easy to drift apart. It takes effort to stay connected. I have a good friend that's actually visiting today, uh, Nate, and he recently moved to Maui, which no one, why would you ever want to move to Maui? I'm not sure about that, but 
he moved to Maui, and uh, I had committed, I never told him this, I'm telling him, I'm confessing right now, he's sitting over there, is uh, I wanted to stay connected to him. I wanted to pursue community with him, even though he's in Maui, the happiest place on earth. And I uh, had a thing I just said, I'm going to call him on Aloha Friday. Aloha Friday, I'm going to give him a call, see how he's doing. So for a while, we were doing Aloha. We did Aloha Wednesday at first, then we did Aloha Friday, and we would just converse and call. Maybe about two weeks, two months in, uh, it just got hard, right? It got difficult. And I'm just confessing this to him right now, right? And, and uh, it was hard to pursue community because basically I got lazy. And it's a time difference, and he wouldn't pick up his phone sometimes, right? That's a hard time. I'm just, you know, throwing him on the bus right now. It's okay. But, but it gets hard. It, 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 it's, it takes work to stay connected, to pursue community. When the going gets tough, we need determination to stay connected. I just wonder, are there people that you need to stay connected to, but you just kind of got lazy? You haven't texted, you haven't reached out, you haven't picked up the phone? Maybe it's your parents, maybe it's a, a sibling. Maybe it's a friend from high school, maybe it's a friend from college, maybe it's your neighbor. Are there people that you need to pursue to say, stay in community? I love the idea that Peter and John, the first thing they did is they go to their friend's house. I think that is so cool. Pursue community. It takes determination. Secondly, it takes a destination, a destination. Think about the word pursue. It, it means you're chasing after something. You're, you're heading in a direction. You're heading for a destination. We need to have vision for friendship. Like, like what kind of friends do you want to have? Something I think about as a, a father and my children. What kind of friends do I want them to see cultivate, cultivated? What's your direction, your destination of the friendship that you have? Don't be deceived. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, Do not be deceived because bad company ruins good morals. We've all heard that saying that you are who you hang out with. So back to that first question, that speed dial, that favorite list on your phone. Well, who are those? What are those names? And let me ask you, are they followers of Jesus? Are there other Christians on that list? Are the people that not just are friends but actually can pour spiritually into your life? What kind of direction would you be heading if you were walking on the road with them? What's the destination? What's the direction? How would they speak into your life? I think about these verses here, Psalm 133, verse 1. How good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. There's something good and pleasant about friendship. Think about Ecclesiastes 4, verse 9 and verse 10. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if, one, for if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. The vision for our church these next summer nights is really just that. We don't want to just be a friendly church. We want to have friends at this church. So the whole vision of setting up these tables and having dinner afterward is just for you to actually pursue community. And we've done the hard work for you. We've already prepared dinner or purchased dinner, right? Last week we prepared it. And we set out the tables. We want to make it the atmosphere in such a way where you can actually do that. And so I challenge you, even in a few moments when we get dismissed here this evening, would you just share a meal with somebody? Would you maybe share your story with someone? How did you come to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And maybe even send a text, like how could you exchange numbers to stay connected over the week? Pursue community, friends. That's how we can endure when the going gets tough. Secondly, we'll spend some more time on this point. Pray continually. Look at verse 24. Now, when they heard it, when the friends had all gathered, they heard the report. Verse 24 says, When they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Watch the text. He said they lifted their voice. So prayer was their first response, not their last resort. One thing we know about the early church is they spent a lot of time praying praying to God, their Father. So when the going gets tough, we pursue community and we pray continually. In fact, just to remind you, the longest standing meeting of Anthem Chapel is not our Sunday morning service, but our Tuesday night prayer meeting. That began months before our Sunday morning service. And friends, there was something exciting about those first Tuesday nights. There was electric in that room. There was passion. There was vision. There was energy. We knew that God was up to something just wonderful. 
And friends, we still meet every Tuesday night, 6.30, right here in the tent. And it is just as electric as it was at the beginning as it is right now. God is speaking, God is moving, and it is. I just invite you to come to the prayer meetings because it is something wonderful and radical. Well, notice first, to who are they praying? Who are they praying to? Look what it says in verse 23. I mean, 24. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices. They began to pray <coughs> to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. So we got to think about who, where, who are their prayers directed to? First, they're directed to the creator of all things. You see that there in verse 24? God, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. So they had to have the right mindset. Who is it we're praying to? God, you're the creator of all things. And you're not just someone that created all things and then vamushed, flew out of here. No, no, you're still intimately involved with all things. You're, remember thinking about Adam and Eve in the garden right there. He's, they're walking with God. There's an intimate interaction with our God, our Father. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. He's the creator of all things. Secondly, who are they praying to? Not just the creator of all things, but the controller of all things. Look at how they pray. They say, sovereign Lord. You see that there in verse 24? Sovereign Lord. Now, if you're a Bible student like many of you are, the word most often used for Lord is the Greek word kurios. Kurios. Like over 7,000 times, is that's the Greek word used for Lord. Kurios. And it means, you know, Lord, ruler. It can be used of like a head of a household. The most common form of Lord is the word kurios. But here in Acts chapter 4, it's a whole different word. It's the word despotes. Can you say despotes? It's a li weird little word. I don't, maybe I'm not even saying it correctly. It means. It means something even more than just ruler. It's the idea of controller over all. Uh, someone with supreme and total control. It was the same word used, just to kind of give you a flavor of how powerful this idea, this word is. It's the same word used when a master had control over their slave. They were the despotes. They were the master, the ruler. The slave had no right of their own. The despotes had total control. So notice what this group is saying in a hard day, in a shift, when things are getting difficult, people are getting arrested, people are getting persecuted. They say, Lord, you are still in control of all things. Amen? You're still control. You're still sovereign. You're still good. You're still God. You still rule. You still reign. Now, why this is important is because when things are not working out, when things aren't like we want them to be, when the going gets tough, we can start to question, we can start to doubt the sovereignty of God, the control of God, the power of God. Now, this is not some foreign idea because we do this all the time. When a circumstance begins to get out of control, we can all of a sudden assume God must have let go of this thing because this circumstance seems to be bigger than God, right? Has anyone ever thought that before? Or maybe there's a person in your life that is just really uh, oppressing and, and bothering you. And you can begin to think, wow, this is a hard, this, the going is getting tough. And this person must have more control than God because they are, I'm in a trial and I am suffering. This is gnarly. And we can begin to doubt and question the sovereignty of God. Now what I love about this is these, these guys, this group, this friends, Peter and John and their friends, in a hard time, in a dark day, they say, Lord, you know what? It, this was tough. We shouldn't have been in jail, but we were. But regardless, you're still controller of all things. You still rule and you still reign. You're still in charge. And we need to be reminded of the right perspective, right? We don't need to tell God how big our problems are. We tell our problems how big our God is. Amen? That's what they were doing. They had the right perspective. Who were they praying to? The creator of all things. The controller of all things. I love this verse, Psalm 89. I'll read a few verses for you. Who is like you, Lord God Almighty? You, Lord, are, might, are mighty. Your faithfulness surrounds you. You rule over the surging sea. Its waves mount up, but you still them. With your strong arm, you scatter your enemies. The heavens are yours. The earth is yours. You founded the world and all that is in it. I love Psalm 89. He's in control. But here's the thing. It might not always look like it. 
That's what they say. Look at verse 27 of Acts chapter 4. They say this. They say, for truly in this city they were gathered together. They were against your holy servant Jesus whom you anointed. Both Herod and Pontius Pilate along with the Gentiles and, and the peoples of Israel to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. So they're saying, listen, they're if there ever was a moment that it looked like God had lost control, it was the cross. It looked like he had given up and, the, and Satan was going to be victorious. And that's what they're talking about. It looked like everyone was against you. And Herod and Pontius Pilate, they had crucified the Messiah. But look what it says in verse 28. But you did whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Oh, people had one plan, but you had a better plan. Because you're despotes, you're sovereign, you're the controller of all things. Who are you praying to? What, do you have the right perspective? When the days get dark, when the going gets tough, we pursue community. We pray continually. Who do we pray to? The creator of all things, the controller of all things. Thirdly, the conqueror of all things. Look at what he says in verse 25. He's quoting Psalm 2. He says, through the mouth of our father David, your servant, and said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth, they set themselves against you, right? And the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. They're quoting Psalm 2, which is always a good, good maneuver to pray scripture, right? Their, their prayer was bathed in scripture. I love that little part right there. But this, this speaks, Psalm 2 speaks about the nations raging kicking against the Messiah, the anointed one. But in Psalm chapter 2, we read that God would ultimately overcome rebellion. Uh, it's not quoted here in Acts 4, but Psalm 2 verse 6 says that, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, on my holy hill. We pray to the creator of all things. We pray to the controller of all things. We pray to the conqueror of all things. God will have his way. Sin can't win, and faith won't fail. We need to remember that when we're in a dark day, when the going gets tough. We need to remember who we're praying to. But notice, not only who, they had the right perspective. Creator, controller, conqueror. But notice what they pray. This is so fascinating to me. What did they pray? Look at verse 29. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. Now, first, I want you to think about what they didn't pray, what they didn't pray. They didn't pray to be removed from the situation. It fascinates me. They don't pray, now, Lord, we know who you are. We have the right perspective. We have the right frame to remember our circumstances. We see you first, right? You're big and you're good and you're great. And we evaluate everything else out of that. And so now, Lord, look upon the threats and grant to your servants to be removed from the situation. Walk us around the valley of the shadow of death, not through it. Rid us of this trial. Remove us from this tribulation. That's not what they pray. They also don't pray for revenge. Oh, Lord, would you grant these, our enemies to be gnashed in the teeth, you know, and plummeted and, and beaten. And, and they're not praying for, praying for revenge either. What do they pray? Not to be removed, not for revenge. They pray for the strength to remain. You see that there? It's fascinating. Oh, now, Lord, look upon these threats, this hard time. This is going, it's getting tough here. But would you grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness? We want the strength to remain to keep doing what you've asked us to do, which is insane because it was boldness that got them in trouble in the first place. It was the boldness of Peter to say, silver and gold, I don't have it in the name of Jesus. Rise up and walk. It was the boldness for Peter to say, listen, Jesus, whom you crucified, but God raised from the dead, hey, you need to get saved right now. It was boldness that got him thrown in prison. And here they are saying, Jesus, we know who you are. And this is what we're asking you to do. Would you give us the strength to keep on keeping on, the strength to remain, the strength to continue to speak in the name of Jesus? Oh, friends, don't, don't let us weaken. Oh, Lord, don't let us cower. Don't let us compromise. Help us continue. Oh, friends, I, I am convicted. I am so convicted reading this. Because when I come into a hard situation, a difficult conversation, a trial, a problem. 
I find myself often praying for, you know, walking around. Lord, help me to get, you know, give me the detour situation here. I pray for protection. I pray for safety. I pray for the hedge, Lord. I pray a hedge of protection, but not a hedge like a the Great Wall of China, something huger than a hedge. I want something bigger on my family. Protect us. And I just wonder, I was convicted. Well, how we often pray for safety. Let's also remember to pray for strength to remain. Strength to, to continue. Strength to endure. Strength to persevere. Because sometimes, sometimes, friends, risk is right. Sometimes the mission of God is greater than the safety of his people. Sometimes. In fact, next week, my friends, we're so excited. Next week, we're having a sweet family that's been in Indonesia for the past year and a half, serving on the mission field. They brought their kids there, and they're living like straight up just, I don't know, but they're living in a hut, but it's gnarly. And they're in Indonesia, and it's gnarly spiritual warfare. My wife met her, uh, uh, their son was in my son's class, and they reconnected. They're here for a little bit. They're going to come next week and share just a little bit about what God's doing. And the fact of the matter is, it's hard. Let me just tell you, it's hard. It's not easy for their family of like four to be in Indonesia just sharing the gospel in a culture that is so antagonistic. Straight up like witch doctors and just gnarly idol worship, just heavy, heavy, heavy. But this is what they're called to do. And for this moment in their life, the mission of God is greater than their personal safety. And I think sometimes I get so convicted because I pray the hedge of protection, I pray for safety. But it, are we forgetting sometimes to pray for strength to remain? Yeah, this is going to be a hard culture. Yeah, First Timothy or Second Timothy says you want it, you're going to pursue a godly life. You're going to endure persecution. It's going to be hard. It's going to be tough. But let's not escape and, and live somewhere high away. No, no, we're in the community. We're to occupy all streets. We're to occupy where we're at. I think about this, parents. I think about just this season that I'm in, I'm raising my kids in a, in a greenhouse. They're in a private school. It's like a greenhouse. The temperature is controlled. There's safety parameters around them. They're in a protected environment. But they can only grow so much in the greenhouse. There's going to come a time, and I believe it's time almost for my, my daughter, we're praying through, is it time for her to plant her in the grove? Because that's where the real growth happens. In the grove is where your roots can grow deep. In the grove, yeah, the temperature can be harsher and the birds can peck at her. And it might be a little bit more difficult, but the grove is where the fruit is produced. The grove is where the growth comes from. So from the greenhouse to the grove. And I just wonder, too often are we finding ourselves in the greenhouse when God's asking us to go out into the world and make disciples of all the nations? Sometimes the mission of God is more important than the safety of his people. So the people, Peter and John, they're praying, this is tough. It's going to get tougher, friends. It's going to get tougher. Remember, Paul, he'll be stoned almost to death and almost to death, and he raises up and goes back into the city. The church is going to persecute. It's going to be gnarly. But they say, oh, God, give us the strength to keep on keeping on. And this, this is also so fascinating. They, pay, they pray, God, would you help us remain? Secondly, they pray, and would the power of God be released? Look at verse 20. Look at verse 30. And while you stretch, I'll invite the worship team to come up. And while you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. Let me just read that again, verse 30. While you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. I mean, this is insane. What do they pray for their city? They pray for the power of God to be released in the community. They pray for the power of God to just come and just flood over. Father, would, not that you would crush them, not that you would change legislation, would not that you do these different things. No, no. We pray in our community that you would stretch out your hand and would you heal. Would you perform miracles? Would you perform wonders in the name of Jesus Christ? I don't know about you, but I haven't prayed for my community like that. I don't pray for my neighbors like that. Oh, Father, for my neighbors, would you stretch out your hand to heal? Would you stretch out your hand to perform miracles in their life? What a challenge this was. What a challenge this is. When the dark days come, are we pursuing community? Are we praying continually? Do you know who you're praying to? Do you know what you're praying for? Are you just praying for safety? Are you praying that you would have strength to endure? Are you just praying for revenge? Are you praying for the power of God to be released? Just imagine if this church, this faith family began to pray like that. Oh, Lord, in Camino Real area, 
on a Saturday afternoon during farmer's market, Sunday afternoon, would the power of God just be stretched out over that place? And would there be signs and miracles over there? UCSB, oh Lord, we pray for UCSB, which is their finals week. We're praying for you students that are here. We're praying for you. UCSB, would you stretch out your hand, Jesus? And would you have signs and wonders and miracles in your name in that place? The different schools, those Pueblos, San Marcos, all the high schools, this, all the communities, San Ro, all the areas. Oh, Father, would you stretch out your hand? Perform miracles. Would you change this culture? Oh, man. Could we see something change in our community if we began to pray like that? I believe we could. Now notice the response, verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place in which they gathered together was shaken. There was a, like a Holy Spirit earthquake in that place. Earthquakes always symbolize a few different things. They symbolize the presence of God, the power of God, and the pleasure of God. So this earthquake happens, and I think God was just saying, hey, I'm, I, I accept this prayer, and my presence is with you, and my power will be released upon you. And it says that they were filled with the Holy Spirit to speak the word of God with all boldness. Incredible, incredible. Oh, friends, today, maybe you're here, and the going is getting tough. And we talk about this a lot. We're kind of coming out, right, of, a, of over a year of COVID, over a year of this pandemic. It's just been hard and, and gnarly. And we have another summer coming up. And you're thinking, how am I going to do another summer? What's kind of going on? All these vac- our plans are changing. And, and, and maybe you're getting going back to work. And maybe you're going to be back in person. And you're worried. There's fear. Do you have a community around you that's supporting you and praying for you? Do you have a friend that you can lean on? Better yet, Are you a friend that others can lean on yourself? Are you a person of prayer? Is prayer something that you do on the last resort? Or is it your first response? Do you frame the right perspective of who you're praying to and what you're praying for? Oh, what a a powerful word we have for us this afternoon. Uh, Would you stand with me this afternoon as we come to a close? Just a moment to respond. Just a moment to respond. We're going to sing this great song. It's an incredible song. Behold the throne. I think behold the throne. Behold, yeah, behold, yeah. And a great song just to meditate, to respond. We're going to have the prayer team. The prayer team will be at the four corners of the tent. And maybe you're here, and maybe there was a name that just came to mind, a name of a person you need to pursue, a name that you need to pray for, a name that you need to text, a name that you need to call. Uh, We'd love to pray with you for that person. Maybe you're here today, and you came alone. And you feel like you're just isolated and no one knows your name and no one knows who you are. I challenge you. Would you come to the prayer team and just say, hey, I just want to introduce myself to you. I'm new here and and I want prayer and I want to be known here. challenge you to do that. Uh, Maybe you're here and you're thinking about your family, seeing all these kids. You're just thinking about your family. Maybe you just need to pray over your family a blessing. We're just going to respond. We're going to worship. And I believe God will do His will. And then we'll close. We'll do our benediction, and then we'll pray for our food, and we'll have a fellowship time. Let's do that.